Welcome to Thriving Entrepreneur with your host, Steve Kidd, third generation minister and 30 year business coach. Listen in as amazing, world changing authors, speakers, and coaches share their struggles and victories. And hear from best selling authors' insight into how you too can live your life as a thriving entrepreneur. This is Steve. Welcome to Thriving Entrepreneur. Thanks for being with me here today as we talk about effective strategies in the workplace. What are the things that different people are doing uh, to make our workplaces better? What are some of the kind of things that are out there these days that are helping corporations and organizations? be able to be a better place to work um, and allow you to have not just work-life balance, but have a good work life. Have the place that you work be a good place to work. And what are some of the effective strategies in the workplace that can really help bring on the right people, have the right kind of environment, um, and even have the kind of clients that are going to Uh, you know, really bring together a harmony um, and a good place to work when you think about effective strategies in the workplace, harmony in the workplace, um, and, you know, all the things that come together to make a person really want to get up in the morning and go to work um, and be effective and really make the difference at that place that they work. Some of us are business owners. Some of us are entrepreneurs in the sense that we are running the business of ourselves. And either way, we want to live a good life. We want to love our job. We want to have it be deeply and wonderfully fulfilling. Um, But we also want to feel like where we work is a good place and it's worth it. There's an old saying that says, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And if we can use some effective strategies in the workplace to make our place a really great place to work, that can be really effective. So let's take a look at what a three people that we're gonna interview here today are doing in their workplaces, for workplaces, to make the world a better place and the place that you work more fun to work out and how you can be at your job, and be a thriving entrepreneur. With that said, let's jump right in to our first guest. Join me in welcoming Devonya Miller. Hey, how are you doing today? I'm doing very well, Steve. How about you? Doing good, thanks. It's good to have you here with us. Today we're talking about your book, Soul Murder in the Workplace. Uh, First off, though, tell us a little bit about you and how you show up in the world. Absolutely. Well, I spent about 15 years uh, in senior management. Um, I had a master's, have rather a master's degree in government program administration. I transitioned into um, mental and behavioral health um, after developing an interest in relationships and work interaction patterns. It started out as sort of team building um, and uh, motivation, motivating um, employees and things of that sort, things of that sort. But then I wanted to go deeper. Um, People bring their feelings and their emotions to work. Um, That led me to completing a master's degree in mental and behavioral health. I chose marriage and family therapy because of the focus on relationships and systems and how systems uh, operate. I'm now a psychotherapist uh, here uh, in the state of Georgia. I am still in senior management, of course, because that is sort of a core love of mine, managing government programs, but now I get to marry the two. Oh, the world of psychotherapy, uh, organizational behavior, um, and government uh, business practices and organizational behavior. So I've got I get an opportunity to work um, in 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 sort of in the at the intersection of all of those very very um, important facets, if you will. Yeah, that's very cool stuff. So tell me first, what was the inspiration for writing the book to begin with? Well, I, I, 
actually it was it started from a personal um, experience that I had. Um, I got I reached a point in my career where I was really facing um, um, work situations that I really didn't have the capacity, um, the coping skills. Um, to sort of adjust to and sort of cope with. Um, it led to my own um, successful experience in, in therapy. Um, I saw a, a, a mindfulness-based cognitive behavioral therapy, therapist, um, and I saw an alleviation of about 95% of my symptoms, and a light bulb came off. A light bulb came on. You know how many other individuals are, are are experiencing anxiety, experiencing depression, experiencing not wanting to get up and go to work um, the next day, um, and it be sort of more so situational um, versus biochemical, um, which those are two very different experiences of those mental health disorders, and. At that point, uh, you know, mental and behavioral health sort of chose me. Um, so I, you know, did some more research, began to dive into it. A large part of my um, thesis in graduate school when I was completing my um, degree to become, my master's degree to become a psychotherapist was the trauma um, that takes place in work, you know, that takes place in the workplace and it can look in in many different ways um, it can be um, it can be uh, ty ty tyranny practices it can be hostile work environments it can be gossiping um, it can be personality disorders within the workplace that take on you know th that take on a different face it can be so many different things um, but it is so murder so murder I borrowed from of course brain science and trauma um, it's when um, um, any any human being that 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 faces um, an adverse situation over and over and over again, that they don't have the capacity to cope with, protect themselves with, they don't have um, sort of the ability to get out of it. It really does commit murder on the human soul. So I, you know, right now, soul murder is really uh, um, it's really. Um, mentioned in trauma, uh, childhood trauma, childhood adversities, but it is very much applicable to what happens to people that go to get up and go to work every day, that have the skills and the ability to do a wonderful job, yet their soul is being crushed um, under some of the different things that I talk about in this book. I love that. Yeah. So let's talk about, um, you know, maybe one of the first questions that comes up, um, you know, why doesn't a person just quit a job that they hate or that's killing them like that? You know, it, it's not, it's not always, there's no one size fits all solutions. Um, people could be facing several different um, circumstances that really, really uh, make it difficult for them to just walk away from a job you know to you know if i can think of an example if you're a single mother um you you have uh skills very good skills in the work that you do you make hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year it provides for you it provides for your family it provides for your future it's not as easy for you to walk away from a toxic environment so murder kind of walks through um and points out the power that in it, that both an individual has in those cases where if you're an individual and you are facing this, you might just be uh, oh, you may be only aware of the symptoms that you're having, um, depressive symptoms, anxiety symptoms, um, losing confidence. If you if you find that you've gone from this confident, productive um, individual who gets results, and you wake up and you're questioning everything that you do, you just don't have the motivation to get any thing done, your your ability to kind of solve problems, all of that is just weighed down. Um, that is you you you're experiencing trauma. And so what an individual, what soul murder um walks an individual through is how to recognize those symptoms, how to normalize those symptoms, not to feel guilty or shame about those symptoms, but it walks a person through self-care practices and um, different mindfulness practices that can build up the spirit and the ego that has been crushed by soul murder. And then, you know, free up the cognitive side of your brain. So when you are going through, when soul murder has happened, um, sort of the cognitive side of our brain, our ability to think, our ability to plan, our, 
our ability to kind of problem solve, all of that is kind of um, uh, sort of hijacked with the, the traumatic symptoms. Um, what I walk an individual through in soul murder is how to um, develop a mindfulness practice, a spiritual practice, jour- things of journaling, um, things such as journaling, um, other self-care practices that kind of calm down the nervous system um, and allows the individual to regulate themselves so much so that they can see and have access to their um, cognitive faculties to say, hey, what am I really dealing with? What are the brutal facts of what I'm facing? And how, what, where do I go next, if that makes sense? Absolutely. So uh, from the other side of things, um, do you think corporations are just unaware that it's happening to their people? Or is it something that you think they're doing intentionally in some cases? You know, I don't think that there is enough awareness of it. Um, I, but, I do, but I have seen that organizations are really beginning to take the bold, bold action steps in facing uh, the fact that mental health is here. Um, I'm even seeing uh, a lot of the shame um, associated with mental health and getting a therapist and, and different things that sort working through emotional stress. I'm seeing a lot of that, um, a lot of acceptance. So organizations are moving in the right direction, um, but there's just, uh, it is not an easy subject to tackle. There are a lot of risk, to be quite honest, in really just addressing uh, when things such as, you know, um, emotional abuse, when there there's tyrant you know, tyranny practices and different things of that sort. So it's not easy. Um, and I don't think that people um, are just, blatantly looking away from it and pretending that the problem doesn't exist. But I do think that there is a lot of work to be done. And my goal for Soul Murder in the Workplace is to just kind of start that conversation, get that conversation, or to add to the conversation, because it's certainly already happening. Absolutely. I love that. So uh, let's talk about some solutions. You find yourself in a position where um, you're dreading going to work every day and you can't leave. Um, what are some uh, first kind of things? I mean, they got to get the book in order to learn all of them, but we'll just pick one. You know, what's something to begin with that they can start doing to take better care of themselves? I think that you just said it. It is recognizing uh, going inside and uh, normal normalizing what it is that you're feeling Um, and just taking care of yourself, admitting to yourself, everything starts with the self. Everything starts with you developing um, a clear understanding. What am I feeling? Where is this coming from? Where did this originate? So you always, it's always best to kind of start doing your own internal work. You know, there's the saying that it is not, in many cases, it is not your thought what happened to you, but it is 100% your responsibility to to walk through your healing journey together. So it always starts with the self, you know, and that could be, um, it could be um, actually getting therapy. Many organizations uh, offer um, employee, we call it EPA um, in most organizations, where they offer maybe eight to 10 sessions of psychotherapy for free. Um, And that just allows an individual to really calm through, get underneath a lot of those intense emotions and to kind of see specifically what it is, what is mine and what has been projected onto me by these situations that I work, that, that I'm working in. So I, I, I would say that as in the book, it always starts with self-evaluation, self-examination, seeing specifically what is going on. You have to be able to kind of name the problem before you can solve it. And of course, uh, you need to get the book, Soul Murder in the Workplace. Um, It is available for free today on Amazon. But um, if a person wants to go deeper with you, um, can they work with you? Absolutely. Um, I have, uh, my company is called Miller Mindfulness. Um, I am on LinkedIn, Miller Mindfulness. I'm also on, um, I'm on Facebook, Miller Mindfulness, as well as um, Twitter. I'm everywhere across social media, Miller Mindfulness. 
so they can reach out to me. Um, also, MillerMindfulness at gmail.com, so they can email me directly um, or reach out to me on all of those social media platforms. And I am ha- I am excited to do this work. It's so important. Um, it certainly, as I, I think I've said to you before, it is a purpose that chose me. So. Absolutely. Well, before I let you go, um, just give somebody that's really going through it some words of encouragement that there is a way out. Absolutely. I want you to start with start with the fact that you are not alone. Uh, millions of people before you have not only gone through this, but they have also gotten over it. There is help, and and I want to normalize the fact that intense emotions they 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 feel awful. You know, feelings of depression, feelings of anxiety, but there is help. There is help. And it's not um, it's not something that is that you have to go through by yourself. And, and it's not something that it's not a hopeless situation. There is help. Reach out and healing is up ahead. There's healing up the road. Well, I love that. I encourage everyone to get the book Soul Murder in the Workplace. As I said, it's available for free today on Amazon. Um, The link is both up in the description as well as down in the comments. Devani, thank you so much for spending some time with us here on the show today. Thank you so much, Steve. Have a wonderful day, everybody. Have your workplace be a place that refreshes your souls and the souls of the people around you. Let it be some place that is good to go to that you're looking forward to being at versus somewhere that uh, you know is kind of um, arduous kind of a pain to have to go to you really don't want your soul to be murdered in the workplace and we need to use the tricks and techniques to be able to make the place that we work both good for us as well as for those that may work with and for us I hope some of these tips helped you And they'll help you live even more so as a thriving entrepreneur. Don't go away. We'll be right back. Hi, my name is Steve Kidd. I am a third generation minister, an international best-selling author of multiple books. And I help people write, publish, and market their books to bestseller. In fact, there are literally thousands of people that have used the system that I created to be able to write, publish, and market their books, and now they're best-selling authors, and you're next. I just wanted to come on for a minute, say hi to you, tell you a little bit about me, introduce myself, and tell you I know the world is waiting on your message, and I would be so honored to be part of sharing your message with the world. Go to AskStevekid.com and schedule a time to talk today. This is Steve. Welcome back. Thanks for listening to A Thriving Entrepreneur today as we talk about effective strategies in the workplace. What are some things that you can do? What are some things you can bring to the table? What are some things that you can create in your company that will make it a better place to work, that will make it better for your employees, better for your clients, just overall a place that really feeds a person's soul rather than murders it as we talked about in the last segment. There are some things that the HR department can do um, that can make that better. And our next guest is going to talk to us about some of the things that are being done that are really cool, that are helping HR departments be able to help the workplace be better and, of course, hire the right people so that it's a great place to work and a great environment. I know you want to hear more about that, so let's jump in to our next guest. Join me in welcoming Keith Good. Hey, Keith, how are you doing today? Great. Thanks a lot for having me, Steve. I'm really looking forward to this. Yeah, thanks so much for being with us here today. First off, tell us a little bit about you and how you show up in the world. Yeah, so um, my my background is in 
information systems. I've got 20 years specializing mostly in the HR space, working on analytics and, and reporting. I've worked for uh, large and small companies, both in the public and private sector, um, industries such as retail, health, manufacturing, banking. And I, I have to, to say around when it comes to, to uh, HR and analytics, the issues are, are really similar, but the solutions are really what, what must fit each organization's uniqueness. So in many times this requires expertise in, in tools around data cleaning, aggregation, model generation, all of which the, the geek in me really enjoys. However, I think that the secret sauce is being able to say yes to, to our clients on their their uniqueness and and special requirements. So that's that's a little bit about me. Um, so I'm I'm looking forward to learning about you as well. Absolutely. Well, let's talk in more detail. Um, what are the when you talk about predictive models for HR? What are the kind of predictions that HR professionals are needing in order to better do their job? Uh, that's a, a good question. I'm really glad you asked. You know, there's some some very common ones out there that that most organizations try to to get, and there's a couple of our competitors and systems out there that say they provide this. But it, some of the common ones are um, flight risk. You know, what is uh, if you can predict a person's uh, potential for leaving the organization, and why is that important? Well, you spend a lot of money getting them into your organization. You spend a lot of money training them, getting them productive. Uh, so, you know, having them leave is certainly that type of cost as well as an opportunity cost. Where are they going to go? They're going to take all that that investment you made and potentially go to a competitor. So that's a, there's an opportunity cost there as well. Um, but that's probably one of the common uh, predictions we see out there. Uh, another common prediction or prediction that we also focus on is what we call a rising star. So a rising star is looking across your, your organization and, and looking at features that have what you believe has made people successful. What are those commonalities? And then generating a predictive model over top of that so you can say, okay, who, who are my rising stars and where can they fit in? So that's a, a fairly unique measurement that's coming coming of age that we're, we're really excited about here. Um, but I think with the, the AI and, and generating these predictions, a lot of people uh, end up scratching their head and saying, okay, well, what did, why did this prediction come out this way? You know, if you're using machine learning, you have to understand that the, the algorithm starts learning based off of, you know, each, all the data that you pass to it. So you could have people that, that are fairly similar with much different predictions and uh, getting an understanding of why that prediction was made is very important. So we've generated something called explainable AI, where after we generate the prediction, we can take that information back through the model and come up with a score for each of the features that was used in the prediction. And that gives people the ability to even do what if analysis. So, you know, if you take a flight risk and you, you see things like perhaps the number of promotions and the, the, the amount of pay were key contributors in that determining that flight risk, we can do what if analysis, say, well, if we gave this person a promotion, how's that going to affect their their ability to to stay in the organization. So, um, you know, again, having that explainable AI is very important. Otherwise, again, people are just scratching their head and saying, well, why, why is this prediction this way? Um, so those are the, the key elements I, that we see in, in the marketplace around predictions and, and machine learning. I found that also interesting. So it leads me to the question I've heard said many times that one of the biggest advantages and disadvantages of some of the newer millennial and especially Gen Z employees is that they tend to be more interested in uh, the impact on the world that the company's making um, and more willing to leave a company, you know, sooner and quicker and faster. Um, does is some of the stuff that you're doing beginning to help us crack the code as to why they're moving? Or is it just kind of taking into account that they do um, live and act that way? And so we, you know, 
don't invest as much into them or or however we're going to do that so that we can make effective use of those folks that are inclined to move? Which way is it going? Uh, that, that's a great question. And it varies. Uh, I, I think that the key for each organization to answer that question in, in their own is to be able to look at their, their own workforce, to look at uh, the key features in their workforce. Yes, obviously, there there are, are certain aspects that you can look from a generation perspective, like millennials and Gen Zs. But let's face it, every organization is unique. And your organization, you, you know, your population is is very so. Um, you you need to generate those machine learning algorithms and those models based off of your own uh, people and and their their historical aspects working in your organization. Um, there are some you know commonalities that we've seen across our client base or around that. And uh, I, I'll look at, I'll answer it in two ways. I've seen organizations that that have seen a lot of turnover in that uh, generation, probably for reasons that you've also specified. But conversely, there's another aspect going on where leaders are looking at that, those younger people that say uh 30 year olds now that are they're looking at that population as becoming the next executives so you know i, I think there's this there's definitely this this uh short term exiting but on the other end there's this long term stay and this ability to get those key uh rising stars if you will into those positions because guess what their organizations are already targeting those people for the next next executive roles. So that's, you know, quite interesting. It's something you said, you know, just the impacting, you know, general generality could then have such a, a, a consequence on the other end for for people that are, are are needing to stay and are proficient as those rising stars to get them in those those next those next executive roles. So kind of interesting. I bet you weren't expecting that, were you, Steve? I wasn't, and it's got me on a whole new train of thought as to, you know, when the generation that's in their mid to, mid twenties to early thirties, you know, when they are my age, you know, in their mid to late fifties, you know, what will corporations look like? Uh, that'll be fun. I wonder what the predictive models say about that. <laughs> yeah. Well, then again, I think that's why every organization, you know, there, there's a lot of systems out there and a lot of our competitors will, will come up with these predictors and they may take data from the client. They may merge it with other clients, you know, but the point is it's a black box and the, the end user client doesn't know what's going into it. Where we like to, to work with our client is kind of that, we're, we're not a, you know, custom for each client, we're kind of in the middle. We use templates to get the client going, but we're working with them all the time to tweak that model based off of information in their organization and information that they they believe will impact that prediction. So, you know, th there's something to be said about that, that black box model where it's just giving you a, a prediction um, you know, how, how confident can you be with that prediction? And then conversely, you, you, you don't want to spend millions of dollars coming up with that prediction and reinventing the wheel. So having that solution in the middle that can get you started uh, and then just tweaking it and configuring it for your own organization, we see is really important. Absolutely. So let's talk about some of the downsides to predicting, um, you know, I mean, maybe my first question is how accurate are you finding the predictions are? You know, uh, glad you asked. And, and that's a good question because the predictions, when we work with our clients and we continue to refine the model, we're, we're typically working for that 95% confidence in, in the model. So that's what we're, we're targeting. Take, for example, flight risk. Uh, it's an interesting model. And, and what we find out is the since most people end up staying, it's really good at predicting staying. And it's really good at predicting people that are potentially going to leave. But it's better at predicting people are going to stay because that's the more of the common aspect. And that's the the data that's in there, <clears throat> but you know other <clears throat> other things in in the model are are important as well. 
and of course, having it that explainable AI can can help you understand, uh, you know, what what elements of the model are are driving its confidence. So those are the ways I would answer that. So as soon as you bring up AI, you know, many of us are, you know, best friends with ChatGPT or others. Um, and then there's a whole lot of other people that are haters of it. I know there's both sides of that fence. But a lot of times when you say, I'm doing such and such and I'm using AI in it, um, there's kind of this knee-jerk reaction in the market right now where people just think they can go to ChatGPT and just make their own predictions. <laughs> I know yeah. you haven't experienced that at all. Um, <laughs> you know, but what information uh, can you give people so that they can understand um, the kind of questions and stuff that you're doing so that you're getting the right answers and not just, uh, you know, some generic or very wrong answer because the wrong question was asked? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And and it really, that's what it's all about. And, and specifically, you know, there, there's a lot of organizations, a lot of vendors out there, you know, waving that that shiny thing and saying, hey, look, look, look at the latest squirrel, let's go after it. And, you know, not knowing everything that's behind it. And and take, for example, chat GPT, I think it's first important to understand what exactly is it? It's um, what they call generative AI, which means it generates something from, from an AI model. Um, and it's bit LLM stands for large language model. So it what it does is it understands language extremely well. It's been trained depending on which models that you use out there. It's been trained on a large corpus of a very diverse set of, of things, whether it's romance novels or um Wikipedia, it understands language extremely well. And it's the breakthrough is because in the past, it, statisticians were trying to understand language based off of words. Uh, but ChatGPT and, and those a, a, those LLM models, they approach it from a, a very different, different way. And the end result is it learns and it understands model or understands language extremely well. What it doesn't do necessarily is it may not have the most recent figures. It may not have more recent data to, to work with. A lot of these models were trained specifically on, on, on data and language that's fairly old, maybe even as old as five years ago. So asking you for, for newer numbers, um, that you're not gonna you may not get that. But what's promising is that you can take one of these models, one of these language models, and train on top of that additional data sets. Uh, for example, you may take a, a, a model uh, like Chat GBT and train all of the uh, data for around uh, an organization's uh, human resources. Maybe you're looking at taking in all the turnovers, all the hires, all of the job changes, all the people information, and you're you're taking that language model and you're training additional data over top of it so that when you ask questions like, well, you know, how many people departed or left or or retired from my organization last month? It understands the question, and now it has more refreshed data to to answer that with. Uh, so that's where I think you know, it's, yeah, large language models and generative AI really needs to go. And specifically, I'll I'll narrow it down to kind of two subjects where I see um, generative AI can really help. One is what we call summarization. So if you have a dashboard, if you have some reports and, and you've got a whole bunch of them and you're displaying that to an executive, having a button that says summarize, where you could take that data on that dashboard, send it to a large language model and have it say stuff about that dashboard that's important for say you know summarizing summarizing all that data quickly in a in a language that can be understood is critical um and i think that's one aspect the other aspect of it is what we call uh, being able to explain so taking a very detailed report a lot of data and then sending that to a large language model so that say that same executive now could go in and start conversing 
about that data and drilling into it more, maybe not from a dashboard perspective, but by asking uh, simple questions or, or questions that the LLM can understand, now they can start getting more explanations from that, that data. So those are the two areas that, that I see uh, generative AI and, and LLMs will, will really start playing out. Um, the question is, you know, the, the first market is, is going to be they're going to see a lot of uh, potential you know, increase in sales or revenues. But I still think getting a, a useful system out there, we're still early in, in seeing that. Mm, I love that insight. So for the folks that would like to work with you, um, what kind of companies do you like to work with and how can they work with you? Oh, fantastic. So we like to work with organizations that um, – probably from a size perspective, anywhere from over a thousand employees to north of a hundred thousand. So we we have some clients that retail clients that have a, a, a ton of employees. We do a lot of work with the federal government. Um, but mostly it's probably the size of around, you know, say two to twenty thousand in terms of employee size. And you know, people that are 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 starting their journey and understanding the importance of workforce analytics. And they understand that one, they could go out and buy a black box and not have much insight into it, or they could hire a whole bunch of developers and, and rebuild the wheel. We're looking for the people that are kind of in the middle that says, you know, we have smart people. We want to have a platform that we can grow off of, a platform where we can take historical data, clean it up and put it into models and, and disseminate that information to our user group. But as we continue to grow, we want to be able to add new models. We want to be able to add new data. And we want to have that platform to, to grow from. And that's where we see the types of clients that we work with. I love that. And give us the URL for where people should go to connect with you. Right. So we're at uh, zeroedin.com. And if anyone in your audience would love to, to carry on the conversation, we'd be happy to, to do so. As you can see, I've, I get pretty passionate about this subject. So I'm always happy to continue the conversation. And my LinkedIn account is Keith A. Good at, at LinkedIn. So, you know, you can send me a message there and, and get connected. Again, always glad to, to carry on the conversation. Well, Keith, thanks so much for spending some time with us here on the show today. Thanks, Steve. Definitely appreciate it. You all know I'm a big geek and I love predictive modeling, AI, all kinds of those tech things. But at the end of the day, using these strategies allows you the most powerful thing of all. And that is that you are able to create a good work environment, bring in good people, um, have a good place so that you can really run a powerful company. Those effective strategies really make our workplace, our work life better for all of us. And it allows us the ability to live as a thriving entrepreneur. We're going to take another commercial break and then we'll be right back here on Thriving Entrepreneur. Don't go away. Hi, my name is Steve Kidd. I am a third generation minister, an international best-selling author of multiple books, and I help people write, publish, and market their books to bestseller. In fact, there are literally thousands of people that have used the system that I created to be able to write, publish, and market their books, and now they're best-selling authors, and you're next. I just wanted to come on for a minute, say hi to you, tell you a little bit about me, introduce myself, and tell you, I know the world is waiting on your message, and I would be so honored to be part of sharing your message with the world. Go to AskStevekid.com and schedule a time to talk today. This is Steve. Welcome back. 
Thanks for listening to Thriving Entrepreneur today as we talk about effective strategies in the workplace. We talked about the things that can kill your soul in the workplace and things that you can do to make it better. We talked about some strategies and some protective modeling for HR that can really allow the HR department to really shine and make the workplace a really great place. And one of the things that I mentioned a couple of times, but I thought we would end this show off with today is talking about the strategy that we use for bringing in our clients. If we're bringing in the wrong clients, it's one of the biggest ways that we can have our culture, our work environment, all of that be really, really awful to have to deal with. And so by having a good marketing strategy, we can do some powerful, impactful kind of things that are going to make a difference. These are some of the effective strategies in the workplace that make our workplace a better place to work and allow us to live as a thriving entrepreneur. So I know you're curious. Let's jump in to our next guest. Join me in welcoming Jacob Longoria. Hey, Jacob, how are you doing today? Hey, Steve, I am incredibly blessed. I'm so thankful to be uh, living this life and on the show with you today. I thank you so much for having me. So glad to have you here with us. To begin us off, just tell us a little bit about you and how you show up in the world. Yeah, absolutely. So I am a digital marketing strategist by trade. Uh, Essentially, what I do is I help uh, businesses and entrepreneurs develop a digital marketing strategy strategy that allows them to grow their business uh, as quickly as possible. Just recently, I uh, left a position as a chief marketing officer for a uh, consulting firm in the aesthetic uh, industry, and I joined another company that I am excited to announce. Their name is Aesthetic Management Partners, and essentially what we do is uh, we help practitioners in the aesthetic industry uh, grow their business with new modalities, technologies, and products. And so, my job as a digital marketer is to, you know, get the word out and make sure that uh, as many people know about us as possible. So uh, that's my main that's my main focus, if you will. I love that. So, uh, you know, for somebody who either doesn't understand the word that you and I know really clearly or they've been living under a rock or whatever that might be, uh, explain to us what digital marketing is. Yeah. So digital marketing is uh, a lot more complex than I think most people think it to be. Uh, I think people like you and I, Steve, know exactly how complex digital marketing is because there's so many facets to it. So here's the way that I explain it. Digital marketing is is essentially two things. It's demand generation and it's lead generation. uh, And those two things encompass complete business growth. And the reason I don't say product sales is because product sales come from a function of lead generation and brand or demand generation as well. So my position as a digital marketer is to oversee all of it. I oversee demand generation and lead generation. And so maybe the next question might be, okay, so how do you generate demand and how do you generate leads? Well, uh, the best way to do it is to number one, know exactly who you are and what you do and how you exist in your marketplace. And I know that sounds like a very, very simple thing, but for those of us that have spent time sitting sitting down and spending hours and hours and hours defining exactly what our business does, who we are and who we serve, uh, realize how deep that can go. And so the depth with which you define all of that will uh, will exponentially help how much demand you generate in the marketplace. And subsequently, uh, as as part of that entire process, it also help you sell more products and generate more leads. And so I would say that digital marketing or marketing as a whole first starts with understanding who you are and who you serve. And from that moment on, deciding the tactical things that are going to make a difference or move the needle when it comes to lead generation, demand generation, and ultimately selling products. I love that. So there are some nuances to it. Let's talk through some of that. Like, for example, you know, I mean, 
at first when we start a business, we're just happy if anybody wants to talk to us. But the longer we're in it, the more that we really need the people to be wanting to talk about what we're really doing and not just, you know, chitty chat about whatever. <laughs> um, how do we or what kind of things should we do to get the right kind of people in front of us in those conversations? Yeah, that's a great question, Steve. Uh, I think you hit the nail on the head when you said, when we first start out, we're just trying to get people to talk to us. And again, uh, not to beat a dead horse, so to speak, but understanding where you are in the marketplace is such an incredibly important thing because it allows you to understand which direction you need to head in. Here's an example. Let's say that you're a brand new coach consultant you decided to start your own consultancy. Uh, you don't have a large team and you're trying to get the word out. Maybe you're working with um, some specific, you know, you, you've networked with some companies and so you're working with some companies, but you're starting to now create some content to get the word out. Well, your digital marketing strategy, in my opinion, is very, very simple. And essentially what you're trying to do is you're trying to funnel people who are interested in you and you're trying to funnel people who have grown to trust you into taking some sort of action. And the action that you want them to take can be as simple as ding, 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 DM me right now so that we can start a conversation and that conversation can lead to a sales opportunity or B, <clears throat> excuse me, or B, download this particular thing or join my newsletter so I can continue to uh, share valuable content with you. If you're just starting out, that's literally as simple as you can be in order to generate, uh, you know, generate revenue very, very quickly. Now, as the business scales and as the business grows, so does the complexity of the tactics uh, with regard to marketing based on an overall customer journey. You know, some of the things that you may want to do is you may want to generate content that generates demand, but the point from which someone becomes a lead to which someone actually purchases from you, especially if it's a high ticket uh, item, can be a bit longer at times. So I would say, number one, completely understand where you are in the marketplace and allow the tactics to follow based on where you are. If you're brand new, let your tactics be simple to generate revenue for your business. If you are well-versed and you're starting to bring on virtual assistants or assistants and a team, then let your funnel, so to speak, be a bit longer. Maybe you are putting out content that its sole purpose is to provide value in the marketplace so that you can grow your demand. Great then maybe you start providing paid advertisements that allow you to provide something of value in exchange for, you know, someone's email address or their phone number or all of the above. Great. And then maybe the third thing you do is uh, if you're consumer facing in particular, maybe what you're doing is you're putting advertisements out that ask people to buy your product, download your app or subscribe to your service uh, immediately. All of those things will be in place as you scale your business. So do you have a favorite? I mean, do you have a favorite place that you like to do ads and marketing to? I mean, I, I know I'm sure you work on all of them, but do you have a favorite one that you like best? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I'm everywhere. So one of the main areas that I like is social media. And the reason I like social media so much is because um, social media has literally allowed us to be able to uh, distribute content, right? Uh, it's disrupted the ability to distribute content. You no longer have to rely on a newspaper. You no longer have to rely on uh, CNN or, you know, some particular, um, you know, news channel like we used to have to. You can now get some information directly from creators all over uh, all over the world. Now, we can debate all day long, Steve, whether that's positive or negative, <laughs> but here's the most important thing that happens with regard to business. The most important thing you can consider is the fact that it is so easy to distribute content that is going to gain attention of your perfect avatar, your perfect customer. And so if you're not 
going deep into that particular tactic, then you're missing a huge opportunity. There's uh, a lot of opportunity in companies, whether it's a, you know, a sole proprietorship or if it's an actual company to become a pseudo media company, if you will, to become a media company that distributes information that allows people to know who you are. I'll give you an example. You know, one of the things that I did in 2023, which was incredibly fun uh, and it was an, a, a, such an, a, a rewarding experience for me was uh, for those of you that know what ClickFunnels is, it's a kind of a funnel builder, if you will. It allows you to uh, drag and drop and create landing pages and sales pages. I had the distinct pleasure and honor of uh, being awarded a two comma club uh, last year for Click, from ClickFunnels. And the way that I did it is I essentially created a book funnel that generated over $4 million in re in uh, revenue for the consulting firm that I used to work for. And uh, that was incredibly rewarding. So again, the tactics can be as complex based on you know what your goal is, but it, the best way to distribute media, the easiest way, the freest way, is to do so through organic social media content. And the reason I recommend that first is because once you get good and once you get consistent at providing the type of content that your perfect audience craves, then you can parlay that content, <clears throat> excuse me, parlay that content uh, into paid advertisements for conversions. Okay, that's awesome. So, I mean, some of the maybe less very popular but less thought of places to do uh, that and then even move into a little bit of or you know a little bit of paid marketing uh things like let's say for example tiktok what are your thoughts on specifically even tiktok yeah i love tiktok i think tiktok is a huge opportunity uh specifically because of the way the algorithm works it's so powerful that instagram is uh over the last 18 months or so has, you know, copied the for you page, if you will, has copied the infinite scroll through their uh, reels and whatnot. It's obvious that the user wants to be a part of that content consumption. And so TikTok has an uncanny ability to be able to deliver content that's relevant uh, to the user. And, uh, you know, 100%, everyone should be capitalizing on that. But it's not just about the content, it's also in how you deliver it. And so I've had several entrepreneurs that I've consulted in the past that are asking questions like, well, what do I say? And who do I say it to? And, you know, I don't have a video studio and all of these types of things. And I'll tell you that in most cases, the most popular and the most powerful types of videos can be a selfie video, can be a, uh, a, a video where you literally are just talking to your phone and saying, Here's why you should care about my product. Here's how it impacts you. Here's how it impacts your clients. Here's how it impacts your bottom line. Here's how it's going to generate more revenue for you. And the way you package the content and the content you actually deliver are two completely separate things. It's almost like a it's almost like a puzzle. You know, it's almost like two separate puzzles that you can kind of maybe a better analogy is it's like building Lego. <laughs> You know, you can take some technics and you can take some regular Lego blocks, you can put them together and create something phenomenal. That's exactly how, you know, creating content or the production value of the content is versus how the content is created and delivered, meaning what you say and how you say it versus how it's produced. Uh, put those two things together in any form and any combination and get that content out because you now have the ability for macro distribution through TikTok and Instagram, especially as the algorithms are improving. But your content should be designed for micro engagement, meaning you want as much brand awareness as possible, but you want the people that can pay you now or buy your product now to pay attention once they come across, uh, you know, your content. I love that. Well, I know that we've given people just a tiny little peek um, and a little taste of some of the things you can do. What kind of people do you like to work with and how can they contact you? 
Yeah, it's a great question. So uh, you can follow me on Instagram is probably my very best uh, <laughs> channel right now. I'm a huge fan of TikTok, but uh, I get overwhelmed because of my schedule, if I'm going to be completely honest with you. Uh, you know, serving the company that I serve and uh, helping some of the people that I help uh, keeps me extremely busy. And so I tend to just go back to Instagram because I absolutely love the way that uh, content is distributed there. So you can follow me on It's Jake Longoria uh, is my handle on Instagram. Uh, I try to produce as much content as possible to help uh, business owners grow uh, their grow their business, grow their practice, grow their consultants, uh, consult consultancy, grow their you know, being an author and trying to sell as many books as possible or products, et cetera, et cetera. And at the end of the day, you have to understand that the best content serves people. And when you serve someone, for example, this this conversation right now, Steve, you know, when 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 we serve your audience with content that matters to them, that really uh, that really makes an impact. And so uh, I would encourage everyone to to go deep on that. So just based on some of the marketing information that I've seen in the past, I think that if you're looking at doing paid advertising, you definitely want to look towards Meta, and uh, which is Facebook, Instagram. Um, I'm a big fan of organic, uh, uh, you know, organic reach on TikTok, Instagram, and LinkedIn as well. So, depending on who your target market is, whether it's business to business or business to consumer, uh, I would consider each of those mediums because again, you can have macro distribution with micro engagement and the micro engagement is your perfect audience looking for your content to be able to purchase from you or become a lead. And so one more time, give us that URL. Yeah, it's uh, just go to instagram.com uh, slash it's Jake Longoria, I T S J A K E L O N G O R I A. Perfect. Well, Jacob, thanks so much for spending some time with us here on the show today. Hey, Steve, I'm so incredibly thankful and humbled that uh, you asked me to be on your show today. It's been a pleasure. And uh, thank you so much, man. It's been amazing. You know me with all the years I've worked in marketing. I love digital marketing. I love the strategies that we can bring to the table. I love how. Uh, all the things that we've done in all the years past are coming back in new and cool ways and how AI and other digital elements, social media, all those different things are allowing us to do more or the same in a different way, but maybe even possibly better. All of those kind of things to be an effective strategy in the workplace, to have our company be an amazing place to work. Whether you're the owner of the company, of course you want as the owner of the company for your company to be an amazing place to work, or you're the lowest man on the totem pole employee, you want to be part of the solution that brings these effective strategies into your workplace so that you can really live the kind of life you want to live so that you can live as a thriving entrepreneur and you bring that to the table. You know why? Because you are uniquely brilliant. You were created for a purpose and the world needs you. And as we bring the best us that we can be to the table, we do the most effective of all strategies. We make the world around us a better place. And that really shows up in the companies we own, the businesses we work at, all the things we do, because just by simply looking at how can I be the best me today, we bring this really cool energy into the workplace that is the most effective strategy at all and makes all the difference in the world, in making the world a great place and allowing you to live as a thriving entrepreneur. See you next week. Thanks for listening to Thriving Entrepreneur today. If you want to get your question answered, send an email to questions at wehelpyouthrive.com. We look forward to you joining us again next time. Hi, my name is Steve Kidd. 
I am a third generation minister, an international best selling author of multiple books, and I help people write, publish, and market their books to bestseller. In fact, there are literally thousands of people that have used the system that I created to be able to write, publish, and market their books, and now they're best selling authors. And you're next. I just wanted to come on for a minute, say hi to you, tell you a little bit about me, introduce myself, and tell you. I know the world is waiting on your message, and I would be so honored to be part of sharing your message with the world. Go to AskSteveKid.com and schedule a time to talk today.